to this strategy class meets and greet with our Australian and US authors. We've come a long way to see you guys, we really and truly have. Uh, my name is Karen Stermitt. I am from Newton Butler and I live in Australia in Perth for the past 11 years. When I moved to Australia, I started um, writing very passionately about children's books at first, then novels, then non-fiction, and I fell into publishing. And since then, I have built three publishing houses from scratch, and we publish amazing authors from all around the world. And you're going to meet a lot of them here today. And some of our Serenity Press Retreat guests, who are actually staying in this castle this week. Now please forgive me because I'm using my voice. Nice and husky. <laughs> but um, we are so delighted that you have come to listen and get to know our authors better. And we hope that they inspire you. We hope that you learn from them. And we hope that you come and meet them afterwards and ask them any questions that you have, okay? So, first of all, Jane Talbot, who is from Northern Ireland, is here today and she's going to do a bit of a talk and then a, a performance for you. Um, and that is a real treat for us all. And then we're going to meet Lorena Carrington. Now, Lorena Carrington is a very tall person at the back. <laughs> and she is an amazing photographic illustrator. When you go out and over to the corner, you will see a nice little display on a little grey um, stand. And those are Lorena's books. And she's going to tell you a lot about those, and they're really fascinating how she does it and how she visualizes these images. Images, okay? And Lorena is one of our Cementi Press illustrators. She's amazing. Then we're going to meet um, a lot of other authors who are some are internationally uh, published, really big, worldwide known authors, and some um, are getting their their emerging authors, and some are aspiring authors. So we, we've got a mixed bag for you to learn from, okay? So without further ado, I would love to welcome Jane Talbot to the house and welcome Jane. Can we give her a round of applause? Good morning. So I've come all the way from the Giant's Causeway, so not as far as everyone else, but I'm really pleased to be here because my next book is going to be published by Science Press and illustrated by Marina Carrington. And yesterday was the first time I actually met Marina, so it's lovely to be involved in this event and to have met all the other authors as well. So, um, whilst I do live in Northern Ireland, you can probably tell from that, and I'm not actually originally from Northern Ireland, but I fell for a farmer of that, is that. <laughs> and actually, the falling for the farmer bit uh, was serendipitous, because that's when I started to write. Up until that point, I had always been a storyteller, so I'm a performing storyteller, I've been telling stories. I had my first live performance in Europe in 1986 when I was on tour. So I took myself on tour with my, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, I'm even blushing using the words on tour, with my guitar on my back. And I, those were the days when you could interrail. So you got a cheap ticket to travel around, and I thought I'd make a bit of extra money by singing. And Dee really didn't go very well. Uh, I used to go into pubs and sales, you know, English, and I could sing English folk songs. Would they be interested? No, thank you. I thought, this is, what am I going to do? Now, I had dark uh, auburn hair at the time, and I thought, well, you could really be Irish. So then I started to say, I was an Irish folk singer, singing Irish songs, and boom! <laughs> <laughs> I made it! <laughs> 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 I feel like my grandparents are actually from Monaghan. So I, I do have some kind of link, but it was a bit tenuous. And as I started to travel around, uh, I really got into it. And I started to tell the story, so folk songs tell the story of how they got their song. And eventually the stories were more popular than my singing. So I started to tell stories, and I continued to do that, telling, telling stories for about over 35 years. I never once, never once thought about writing them down. I've moved all over the place. I've lived in 30 different places, and um, about 10 years ago, 2009, I went on a blind date. I did lots of rash things. It wasn't any old blind date. I was living in 
in Scotland. And I'll, I'll have to admit it was on my bed. <laughs> and I put, I want to meet someone within a hundred mile radius of Glasgow. And I, of course, I didn't realise the Northern Ireland came within a hundred mile radius. And this guy wrote to me, and I thought, well, I'm not. So uh, we phoned, and he said, I'll meet you at Derry Airport, and just make sure I can recognise you. I said, you'll know me. So I got up the airplane in a Viking helmet. Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus sandals and knee end socks and the rest is history. And I travelled to and from Scotland and at one point I had to make a decision because I had a son who went to secondary school that would actually have to move here or just have to have a very long distance relationship. So I moved over here only to find that culturally it was a very different place and all the things I used to do which were easy which involved adventuring. So I'm a theatre maker, I'm a writer, um, and I also adventure, so I go up and down mountains and ski very cold places and all that kind of thing. And I just couldn't do it. Plus I had a son to carry around because we were living in a rural area. So I, in 2014, on December 31st, I decided I would take a year to do a year of adventure. So I tried to prove to myself that you did not even have to leave your kitchen to lead an adventurous life. So I set up a project called 365 Days of Adventure. I didn't know what would come out of that adventure. All I knew was I wanted to feel the aliveness that comes with taking risks and doing new things, not knowing whether you're going to be successful or not. And that's a big, I suppose, paradigm of writing. You don't know whether you'll be successful or not. So really, you have to invest in the process itself. That's the thing that has to bring you the greatest joy. So I didn't know where to start, so I started with obvious places like eating sprouts. <laughs> and uh, th so you, if you're interested at all, because that's an obviously a dangerous sport for me, eating sprouts, <laughs> um, I kept a video blog, 365 videos that are on YouTube, of all the things I did. So I ate sprouts, I performed a memory feat, I memorised the periodic table, which has never been useful to me except for at dinner parties after a certain time. <laughs> I learnt foreign languages, I learnt to play chess, I did all sorts of things. And eventually the field that was this big started to narrow itself down. I, I really got a feeling of being on track. And what I did is I went into Tesco and went to the bottom shelf in the book section and got myself a Mills and Boone book. I also, it's called Harlequin Press these days. Mm. And I thought, well, I've never read a Mills and Boone book. I've never read any of the fiction. It's just not my thing, I don't think. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have an adventure and I'm going to read uh, some romantic fiction. It was a medical romance. And I thought, gosh, by the way, these shouldn't be on the bottom shelf. No. And of all the old ladies who have them in their trolleys, I was thinking, whoa, no wonder their trolleys packed high with lots of food. I thought, look, how hard can this be? Just how hard can it be to write romantic fiction? So I set about writing a book which actually hadn't been published, and there's good reason why. Because every time I introduced a man to the story, I had this instinct just to kill him off. <laughs> <laughs> and I got really good killing him off. Then in the first chapter, the first one drowned. It was pretty regular. You know, it was random, a big wave came, and that's not the way we thought that would happen, is it? <laughs> By the time I got into the third chapter, it was brilliant. It was in Pakistan, it was in a mudslide, Terribly slow death. <laughs> anyway, after three chapters, I thought, do you know what? This is much harder than it looks. <laughs> I don't think I'm for romantic fiction, <laughs> but for grisly, gruesome death, I thought. <laughs> so I put that to one side and then decided to have a tree identification adventure. I'd learn from the shape of a tree and its leaves what it was. I was talking to my husband, who's a, a farmer telling about hawthorn trees and all the lore, the folklore associated with hawthorn trees. And if you don't know about hawthorn trees, you should, because no hawthorn trees are associated with fairies. He said, well, we've got no birds on the farm. So I did everything you need to do to learn about how to track down a fairy. And obviously the first thing you do is you go on YouTube. So I went on 
teaching them. Watch this video about how to sue fairly. I thought, right, that's it, we're off. We got in the back of the van and we went on a fairy hunting trip. We parked a respectful distance from this tree, also called the fairy thorn, and I had to smudge sticks because everyone said, you've got to protect yourself because like, you're going to get attacked by fairies. So you smudge sticks around the van. And the best time to see a fairy, if you don't know, and you should, it's at twilight, the most time of the day. So just when it's getting dark, just when the dawn's coming. So it was July, so uh, it was about 20 past 10, 20 past 10 was twilight. So I went down to the fairy floor and I offered what you should. Did you ever see a fairy? No, I did not see a fairy. I thought, don't worry, don't worry, because you've got no chance of doing one. So we got up at about four o'clock in the morning, went down to Fairy Thorn, and you can actually see this in the evening as well. Um, the mist was rolling in, the sky was a kind of purple, and the tree was like super duper. It was like it had been imprinted onto this purple background. And to be honest, if you watch the video, you can hear a little bit of fear in my voice, because on one hand, I thought, I don't know if people think I actually believe in fairies. But on the other hand, I was thinking, I totally believe in fairies. There's no so I'm waiting and I did not see a fairy. So I went back to bed and when I woke up, two things happened. One, my favourite hat had disappeared. And two, there was a story about that tree fully formed in my head. This is too scary. So I went home and in seven days I wrote that story down. And to, in order to complete it, I had to learn every inch of the farm and the surrounding area. It all featured in that story. And it did absolutely brilliant because one of the things that that project Feeling the Fit and Love Global Adventure did for me was to connect to me to local people. It connected me to the land and to my husband's heritage and to the people and to the language. So some of um, what I write in the Irish tradition and some of what I write in the Ulster Scots tradition you know, fused the two together. And so I wrote that story, and I didn't think anything of it. I didn't consider myself to be a writer. And I wrote it as I speak, so in the oral tradition. So as a lot of direct address to the reader, I thought, well, I'll tell you what, for an event, I'll send it off to a publisher. Just, you know, have a crack. <laughs> so I sent it off. I didn't expect to hear anything at all. And I got a book called The Writers and Artists Yearbook, which if you're a writer, you probably know that book. We've got all the editions of it. And I went alphabetically, so I went to the first publisher in Northern Ireland um, at the beginning of the book, which is Black Circle Crew. So I sent it off. Just, I thought that would be just one. Yeah, nothing's going to happen. Anyway, six weeks later, I get an email saying, that's, that's a great story. Can you send us the rest of the book? <laughs> no, there's no rest of the book. <laughs> so I go back so there isn't actually a rest of the book. Uh, Think about, you know, maybe some little freestanding, maybe like CD or something like that. So then I'm going to have to write another story. I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Because that first story appeared by magic, and it was a gift from the fairies. And my husband said, well, you're just going to have to get a gift from the fairies. I said, well, I don't know where to go. I said, you know, I feel like I've done an ABC trip. <laughs> so he took me then to a place called Murloc Bay. So there's a Murloc Bay in County Down. There's also a Murloc Bay up in the county entry. And uh, it, absolutely incredible wild place. And you can see over to Scotland, and immediately I can see over to Scotland there's a kind of ache in me. So all the stories I write are actual true stories, they're my personal stories, covered in local folklore, and then a spin of my own story around that. So I wrote a second story, and I got a publishing contract, and then had to write the rest of the book. As a result of writing that book, I suppose I suddenly felt very rooted here in a way I've never felt rooted anywhere. I've always had itchy feet, I've always wanted to move on, I've never really completely felt at home. But because I had to listen to the land and respect people's culture, so when I was researching the second story, the Mero of Merloch Bay, so Mero is the Irish or Anglo Irish version of a merman or a mermaid, there is a local legend about clay, healing clay, which the McCormick's, and only a McCormick can lift this clay. 
And so I had to make sure when I was using people's names, their families still exist because people don't move around very much. But those are always the good people. Those are always the good people. And when you make people, no matter whether they're good or bad, good, then they become lovely people. So I've had from that book a life, and I don't mean a writer's life or an author's life or fame or fortune, which you never get as a writer anyway. I've had a life. And so there's a part of me then, as a result of that experience, decided, well, you know, I'm here for good. And if I am here for good, what other stories are there? So I then, um, there was a little bit more magic to that story. So that, my book, The Fairy Fall and Other Stories, um, one of the places you can get it is in the visitor centre of the Giant Causeway. And two years ago, Toronto Press had the trip with it here. Mm -hmm. it here. And part of it was uh, a tour to the North Coast, and one of the editor, Monique Monaghan, brought my book. And she read it on the plane on the way home, and the fairies must have been smuggled in custom back any problem whatsoever. <laughs> because I had a note from Monique saying, Oh, you know, we'd really like you to write a collection for us. And I thought those fairies are absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I went back to the tree and I gave them some more whiskey and cream, which is true, disappeared. Now, then if my husband took it, I like to believe they are actually, you know, still blissed out on it. And the fairy magic is still working. So if you were to ask me, do I believe in fairies? I definitely believe in something. And I definitely believe in the land. And there's something very magical about this place. And maybe as an outsider, I see that magic or experience that magic differently. But I think uh, as an outsider of what's called as a blow-in, uh, in my, where I live, and it will be maybe 500 years before my children's 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 children actually become locals. Mm -hmm. The stories that grew out of the land have become my story and have kept me connected to this place in a way that I feel comfortable. Somebody said to me, you know where you belong, where if someone asks you where do you want your bones to lie when you're gone, I would be happy for them to lie here. <coughs> so what I'm going to do I'm going to, uh, so there's a new collection coming out in July next year with Serenity and Marina um, will be illustrating it. And those are also stories all based in the North Coast as well, or places that have been important in my journey. So um, my husband's a farmer, traditional farmers are like spending any money whatsoever. So um, when we went on our honeymoon, we went in the back of his van, we bought a mattress in the back of his van. And we went to Donegal, it was like lashing down with rain, got absolutely wet and then we came home. We had one, a one night honeymoon, but out of that one night honeymoon, this story came. This story is set in Donegal. I, so I wrote a show um, called The Wonder Tales, which toured Northern Ireland. And you might have seen the fairy form. The fairy form was adapted for stage at the marketplace. In, it was in Armagh and it was in, I think it was in Enniskillen as well. Um, so I wrote a new show and so I always speak my stories first and then I write them down. So this story, I'll just do a little, a tiny little bit from it, is in the next book. And this one is called The Selkie Bride. There was once a young man who lived in Carrick Finn in Donegal and his name was Mahesha. And I'm telling you the truth when I say there was no man second name for Mahesha is the old Irish way of saying seven. Mahesha means six plus one. And on the day Mahesha came into the world, he joined six older brothers, the youngest of whom was already a full seven years old on the day Mahesha was born. And his seventhness was not confined to his relationship with his brothers. Oh, Mahesha was the seventh son of the seventh son, and Mahesha's father's father was also the seventh son of the seventh son himself. But, in spite of his seventhness, the power of the cure he did not have. Nor was he in possession of the second sight, nor did he have a ferocious appetite for battle, like the mighty Kuhanan, the greatest sailor of all time. 
seemed like the hair show was cut from a cloth more ordinary. Although it does have to be said that he did have an uncommon gentleness about him and an unusual preference for the company of the sea over the company of people. When Hesher was seven years old, he could take his own current out onto the water by the power of his own oar and spend the whole day fishing, listening to the lapping of the waves against the side of his boat, watching the sparkle of the sun on the surface of the water, and following the birds who knew where to make the best by the time he was 14, Mohesha was the best fisherman in the Catholic faith. People used to say that when he took his boat out, the lobsters would fair run into his creels before he lifted them. They said the glashans would leap into his boat of their own accord. And they used to say that shoals of mackerel would dig through the water around his boat and call in clam and char alike even when the char was way up north in icy waters. On Mohesha's 17th birthday, on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year, Mohesha rose early when the moon was still high in the clear night sky. The weather was set for a perfect day's fishing and he was keen to get out onto the water. He made his way through the marrow of dune, through sedge, through spurge, and through sea holly. And as he approached the cove at Cavic Finn, he heard a strange singing. It was the kind of singing that could break your heart wide open and brimful it with all manner of sweetness. He slowed his step, he hushed his breathing, as best he could. And when he got to the ridge that looked down onto the strand, there before him, he saw seven uncommon beautiful women dancing. He hid himself behind a clump of marron grass and he watched them dance and he listened to them sing and how they did magic him with a haunt in their voices. And how they did magic him with a look of their bodies, each had long, straight hair, hue and shine of a chestnut straight out of its casing. Each had big brown eyes, not a drop of badness in them. And each had skin that shone as silver and as bright <coughs> as the North Star. Mahesha looked all about the strand, and he saw how seal skins were hidden behind rocks, and when he saw those skins, he knew that these women were no ordinary women. He knew that these women were seal women. He knew that these women were selkies. And he knew that if he took one of those skins, the owner of that skin would have to stay with him. She'd have to leave the sea. She'd have to marry him. She'd have to live with him, like it or no. He crept down onto the strand and he took one of those skins and returned to his clump of marrow grass. And when the first streaks of dawn red in the sky, the selkies went behind the rocks and took their skins and pulled them on and dived back into the sea, all except one, who couldn't find her skin because Mahesha had it. The selkies started to cry, and if you heard that cry with your own ears, you would have taken it for the saddest song that ever got sung. Mm -hmm. I will not steal you from the sea. You would make me the finest wife I could wish for. But take this skin. You must go home. The Selkie softed a smile at Mahesha. And this is what she said to him. She said, because your heart is righteous and because there is nothing but gentleness in you, I will go with you and I will be your what she did. She went with him, she became his wife, and a great 
the love grew between them, as wild and as beautiful as the orchids that grow in the hollows between the sound June ridges. And in spite of the fact her skin was not locked away, she never ran away or tried. She never left her husband. And Mahesha never locked that skin away in spite of his brother's warnings. Didn't that brilliant from Bombay have a selkie wife? And didn't his selkie wife find the key to the box he'd hidden her skin in? Didn't she take that key and didn't she open that box and didn't she pull that skin on and didn't she run away to the sea and never come back? That's what Mahesha's brother said to him, but Mahesha said, I want a wife who wants to stay with me, not one that has to stay with me. If my wife wants to run away back to the sea, then so be it. And so Mahesha hung that selkie skin next to his own shirt, and there it stayed. And although she held that skin from time to time to remember her cell phone, she never took it, and she never ran away. Well, she didn't for the first year, anyway. And that's all for me. Thank you. Wow. Did you get that? Awesome. You have to watch it very carefully. Okay, everyone, so now you're going to, um, to meet Marina, Marina Carrington, who is going to be the other half of the Jane and Marina show at Serenity Press next year. <laughs> so you can watch out for that book. We will send out information to you all if you have your email address, okay? So let us know if you're interested in learning more about their collaboration. But welcome, Marina. Karen, and thank you, Jane, for such a beautiful story. Um, as you can mention, I cannot wait to work on the illustrations for that one. In fact, I've sneakily started working on a few. So, as you know, I'm an illustrator. I'm what people might kindly describe as an unusual illustrator. I don't want to know what they unkindly <laughs> describe me as. They don't need to tell me. So um, when I begin an illustration, um, unlike most illustrators, I don't pick up a pencil and sketch. I don't pick up a pen. I pick up my camera and my walking boots and I walk out into the forest, or in my case, in Australia, into the bush. Um, and I collect two things. I collect photographs and I collect things. So I will pick up leaves Photographing them up close, it throws the background at a 
the focus, um, which makes it a perfect backdrop for these silhouettes that I lay over the top. So I'm going to pass around this illustration. It's a bit hard to see from here, probably. So that's an illustration from the first book I did with Karen and my, my author, Kate Forsyth, <laughs> who's a magnificent Australian author. Um, and it's for a story called The Rainbow Prince. And I knew that I needed a bridge of skulls. Now, skulls I had plenty of. I have a skull shelf, in fact, in my library at home. Do you? Do you? I do. Of course it is. <laughs> Who doesn't? Um, but I was trying to work out how to piece together those skulls into a cohesive bridge. And we had some friends today, and they went for a walk up behind the back of our house. Um, while I was working away. And I came back and, and my friend had, had been wearing a beautiful blue and expensive silk scarf. And she brought it back all bundled up with a little knot tied in the top. She said, I've got a present for you. You'll never believe what it is. And I knew that they'd just been walking in the bush up behind our house. So I put the bundle down and opened up the knot and laid out the scarf. And inside was a pile of bones a little skull perched on top. And while out walking, they'd found a whole box skeleton laid out. It was clean, had been completely picked over by ants, like you see. Usually, um, if something's died out in the bush, it will be scattered <laughs> around by other foxes, dogs. But it was perfectly laid out, and they picked up every single bone for me and brought them home. And they were so really well for this. It was the most perfect gift they could have brought. So I photographed all the bones one by one and made sure I photographed them to scale. And then I got on Google, how, the, how does a fox go together? So, um, it was like the most magnificent jigsaw puzzle I've ever done. <laughs> so I pieced together the um, skeleton again and, and the fox now lives on um, in this illustration. So that's how I, I work and how I make my books. Um, I've been a practicing artist for about 20 years, um, making this kind of work for about 10 years. I used to be a total purist, black and white prints, made my own chemicals, locked myself away in the dark room for days at a time, and then I had children. <laughs> so obviously that wasn't going to be um, a realistic way of working. So I switched to, to digital, even though I thought people were going to take my work. <laughs> Um, and I started making this montage work. So I've been working as an exhibiting artist for a long time. And um, this is a great story of the power of social media. I met Kate Forsyth um, on Twitter through mutual friends. And she bought a print that she liked so much. And we kept in touch. And she asked me one day what I was working on. I said, well, I'm working on this exhibition at the moment. Um, I'm going back and finding old fairy tales. Um, because what we think of as fairy tales now, so often are the princess tales. It's Rapunzel in her tower, it's um, Snow White asleep in the glass box. The, um, if the women don't have any agency themselves, but I, we know that they're out there, we know that there's a long history of um, tales of girls and women slaying their own dragons, yeah. having their own adventures. So I'm going back and I'm finding these tales and I'm making an artwork based around them. And Kate said, well, that's funny. I'm doing exactly the same thing, but I'm retelling them. I think we need to work together. And Basilisa was born, and with the most incredible serendipity, we found Serenity, <laughs> and we haven't looked back since. And if it wasn't for Karen and Serenity and, and um, for Jane, people out there that I'm working on with her now, I wouldn't be here. So I'm, I'm on my, my grand European tour, I'm calling it. So I've been to France working on a book with an Australian author called Sophie Masson um, for Karen as well, which will be a collection of French tales, some which have never been translated into English before. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> and so excited to be working with Jane. Her writing is so extraordinary. And as you heard from the way that she speaks her tales, that really is how these stories are written. They have the most incredible rhythm and depth and life to them. So. Um, it's going to be a good year working on those. And I'm going to pass on to the next person. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
not so special, you get that beautiful insight. Whenever I met Marina and seen her work, I thought, she is a genius. What she does with photography is amazing. So be sure to go and check out her work and um, over at, at the display and, and watch out for these special books. It was through Kate and Marina's um, initial collection. We're only supposed to do one book and I think there's about seven books lined up now. So every March we release a new collection. And so this March we, we're releasing a retelling of Snow White and Red Rose. So watch out for those, they're really special. Okay, I'm going to introduce our next author and this is Juliet Murillier. Juliet came with us on the Serenity Press Retreat in 2017 and she is back. She is a magnificent author, one of my favourites. So I want you to learn from her and wait till she tells you how many books she's written and published. It's amazing. You have so much to learn from her. I just know we've been learning so much last time. So you're in for a treat. Give her Juliet. Lovely to be here again. I'm very pleased to see that big contingent of school students in the back of the room. Um, and feeling slightly old because I now have a granddaughter who is the same age as most of you and would be sort of sitting among you listening, but she's, she's in Australia at the moment. And, uh, school holidays are on, but back to school for her second last year of, of high school. Okay. Um, I feel like that was a very hard act to follow, people who speak very fluently. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, I thought I might talk a bit about my own journey to writing, not for long, but just for a bit, because I imagine a lot of you, as well as being keen readers, are also writers, fledgling writers, or perhaps successful writers. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no single path towards becoming a writer. It's something that you probably have the foundations of in your early childhood, and some people become writers of published books early. Some people go on writing for their own self-development just because it makes them feel happier or feel more fulfilled. Uh, some people will just write a little bit of poem, perhaps write a story for their children. Some people go out and make a career of it. It's different for everyone, and there's no right or wrong way of doing it. You just it's something that comes from the heart, which you do because you love stories and you have a story in there that's busting to get out, so you write it down. I loved to read as a child. Um, we had a fabulous children's library. I grew up in New Zealand, um, but my ancestry is Scottish with a little bit of Irish, which has sort of come to the fore now that I'm writing fantasy. Um, and used to just go and borrow stacks and stacks of books from the library when I was quite small and fall up hill home with them and read all the time virtually. And what I loved reading more than anything was Celtic folklore and fairy tale, myths and legends, and that kind of seeded itself inside me so that when I started to write myself, those are the kinds of stories I like to write. Stories of courage and adventure and faith and true love and all those qualities that sometimes we might feel are sort of seeping out of our lives now, but they're still there. They're still qualities that we can put into our everyday lives and the way we make our decisions. Um, so don't think for, for a moment that fairy tales and folklore and myths and legends are not relevant to the life you live now, because what they're all about is learning how to live your life with courage and faith and trust and truth and all those fine qualities that we used to put into the heroes and heroines of those types of stories. If you think back to a time when people were living in small tribal communities, when they were very dependent on the land for survival, they were at the mercy of storm and famine and flood and years of bad crops. So their lives were so attuned to the land it's hard perhaps for you to imagine how it was unless you are maybe in the farming family now where some of the same challenges are still present in everyday lives. Um, it's no wonder that those people believed in powers of nature that were either maybe gods or spirits or they were fairies or they were ancestors to whom you had to say the right things, to whom you had to do the right acts 
love the hawthorn tree, you know, place your wish on the hawthorn tree in the form of your little bit of a hair ribbon or a shoelace or whatever, and you make a prayer to the fairies or to the powers of nature that your crop will be okay this year or that your husband won't be drowned when he's out on his fishing boat or that your child will be able to grow up with enough to eat. Um, they believed in nature as a spiritual part of their lives. Um, and I guess when I'm writing now, um, I'm combining that sort of story, not necessarily an actual fairy tale, but elements from those sorts of beliefs that people would have had as part of their everyday life. Um, the belief in something that's either an other world or it's a part of this world that can't be explained by science, that there are presences out there that are powerful, that have to be considered when you're making your decisions in life. Um, it's like, so when I write, I'm always aware of that background of folklore and fairy tale, but I'm also thinking about us now living our lives and how we make our choices and how that influences us. I was thinking coming back here, because my stories, particularly the current series, are based in Irish history, very loosely based in Irish history. Um, so, and I say that as a, you know, an outsider, um, with all humility, that I'm using this material that probably only belongs a tiny bit to me through my that little thread of Irish ancestry, but coming here feels like coming home. Um, when I went walking on the estate here through the forest and saw the beautiful colours of the leaves and the little ferns growing and the special stones coated in moss and so forth, I really literally felt like I was walking into my own story that I was writing. It felt absolutely real to me and I, I, you know, I was on the verge of believing that some of my other world characters were just going to walk out from those little cracks in the rocks and, and greet me. Um, it became totally real. Why is storytelling of this kind so important? Well, when those people who lived in communities that were barely subsisting with what they had, they would gather around the fire at night and they would tell stories. And they wouldn't be the story of how, you know, Johnny over there sort of went to visit the girl in the neighbouring village. They'd be stories of wonder, stories of magic, stories of ancient times, sometimes silly stories like the one about the guy who messed up his three wishes and ended up with a string of sausages <laughs> from his nose forever after. Um, stories about thwarted love, stories about not quite understanding the people who live across in the next valley because they're different in some way. You know, we wear our hair this way, they wear their hair flattered, they wear red belts, they wear lots of red in their clothes and we never wear red because red is dangerous. Things like that, you know, differences that have to be explained. So you don't explain that to your community by saying, yes, you've got to be more tolerant and so forth. You explain it by telling a story, a funny story about something went wrong. Or a story, you know, if you're afraid of something, if someone in your village is afraid of something, you tell a story about going out and finding the monster in the woods, whatever that monster is, and whether and how that young person in the centre of the story managed to defeat or overcome or make friends with that monster. It's a fun story, it's entertainment, but in, at the heart of it, there's something to learn about your life. In a way, even though I live now in, in this age of, you know, sort of technology and uh, tumult of all sorts of kinds, I feel like I'm telling the same kind of story. I'm writing a book to entertain. Um, there's a lot of magic in it. There's interaction with the other world. There are adventures in this world. There's a bit of history. There's a bit of fairy tale. But basically, it's a story about you people who are going to be reading it. If you read my stories, you'll find that there are characters who, even though they ride horses and fight with swords and uh, occasionally accidentally cross over into the other world when they're not expecting to, they have the same sorts of challenges as you. So you look at them, they're like you, even in that time. They're facing a challenge, they're dealing with the challenge either bravely or not. They're interacting with each other. There's love, there's hate, there's misunderstanding. Um, so it's a story, I always feel the characters are the absolute heart of the story. If you read the book, there's a character who's like you, or like someone you know, or who's facing the sort of difficulties you face, then you will follow that story with a deeper enjoyment. Right, sound like I'm waffling now. So, um, I think all I'll say is that, you know, the setting of my books is, it feels like Ireland, it's, it's undoubtedly Irish in terms of the names and the places. This particular series, which is called Warrior Bards, 
is set in almost exactly this, this part of Ireland. Um, but it's different because there's lots of magic happening. There are people who move between worlds. There are characters who are undoubtedly straight out of Irish mythology. Um, but it's a story about three 18-year-olds, um, Levon, the girl, and two boys, two young men, um, who are sent on a secret mission. They're training to become warriors in an elite establishment which has appeared in some of my previous series of books, but this is a standalone. And they get the opportunity to be sent on a, a spying mission to re retrieve uh, sacred artifacts that's gone missing. Um, and the reason they're chosen is that two of them are very fine musicians who used to play you know, at the local drinking houses and uh, at weddings and so forth before they joined this warrior band. And so it's a story about spying, it's a story about an, a royal court, it's a story with lots and lots of music in it because before I became a writer I was a musician and it's an adventure and it's also all about growing up and learning to be wiser and so forth. So um, I'm saying that because I don't have many copies, but if anyone wants a copy, they need to talk to me. Also, people from school, I'm going to donate a copy to your school library so someone can pick that up and take it back. Um, I guess I also have to say, in terms of my story, before I end, that that little girl who loved books wrote a lot as a primary school student. I was quite considered to be good at it. Um, we used to write our own stories and pass them, pass them around and we'd all give each other, you know, three stars out of 10 or whatever it was in the comment. Um, and then, rather than going to university to do creative writing and becoming a writer, I went to university and did music and did a whole lot of other stuff, including getting married, having four children, years and years and years of all sorts of other things. And it wasn't until I was in my late 40s that I began writing seriously again. And I did that because I'd been through a very, very unhappy period in my life and needed to fix myself up, needed to start a new life. And I'd always wanted to write a particular, make a particular fairy tale into a, a novel with real characters. That was my first book, um, Daughter of the Forest based on that fairy tale about the girl whose brothers get turned into swans and she has to be silent while making them shirts out of nettles and at the right moment she has to be able to throw the shirts over their heads and they'll be transformed back into young men. Um, wrote that book without thinking anything about being a writer as a career. I was working in a very boring public service admin job at the time just to keep the money coming in. And was one of those really lucky people who sent my manuscript to a, a big publishing house in Australia and they happened to be wanting a new fantasy writer at the time and so I got a contract on the basis of that book plus an outline for two more to follow and I've had a career as a writer ever since then. That's <coughs> 20, 20 years since my first book was published. I've done slightly better than one a year since then and um, I'm just absolutely blessed and incredibly lucky to have had that, that good fortune. But, you know, what it's all about for me is not, what did you say, fame and fortune and mm -hmm. fame and fortune. Fame and fortune, not what I was after. I wanted to be able to write what I love to write, what makes me happy, um, and feel like I was sharing that and sharing a gift that's all about <coughs> how stories help to people, help to teach people lessons and help to heal people who are unhappy or wounded in some way. Fairy tales and fairy tale based stories are very, very powerful because they've got those basic qualities in them that will help you to become strong. Um, all right, that's enough from me. I have a limited number of books with me and so people can come and talk to me about those and take one of my free bookmarks. And I just wish you all lots of happiness with your future discovery of great books to read and for those who are writers with all sorts of wonderful creative writing to come. Thank you. Juliette is one of my favourite speakers. I love listening to her speaking about her books. Did you expect that to come out? Hey, how many books have you published, Juliette? Uh, Twenty-three now. Twenty-three novel-sized books with big publisher. That deserves a big clap. And 
And um, I'm now going to introduce Carolyn Wren. Carolyn is a Serenity Press author of Romantic Suspense. She's another powerhouse. How many books have you published, Carolyn? Twelve? Five. Twelve or five more in the pipeline, as you do. And <laughs> um, you're going to be inspired as, as well by Carolyn. So, Carolyn Wren. Okay, hi everyone. Um, the first question a writer gets is, "Did you always want to be a writer?" And my answer is no. Um, I struggled writing witty comments on birthday cards and then just ended up writing happy birthday after 10 minutes so i had no words in me all my words my life was numbers um my only concept of uh, knowing anything about writing was i became friends with a tv producer who was working in australia working on a science fiction show and his world was full of stories and i really envied that but i never thought of it for myself until 2009 when I woke up with stories in my head and I sat down and started writing them. Three years later I was still writing, book after book after book. I had no idea what to do with them. So I started entering writing contests and winning writing contests. So then I was an unpublished author with trophies. And because of these contests it, I sort of heard about this independent American publishing house called uh, Secret Cravings. They took on one of my books and then I won another award for something else, so they decided to take the whole series. And they said to me, can we publish these eight books in a year? Okay, here's a, here's a little point. If someone says to you, can we publish your eight books in a year, say no. Um, I didn't, of course, say no. I'd never been edited, I'd never, I didn't know the first thing about editing, and here I was on this massively steep learning curve publishing all these books. That was great, it was a crazy busy year. I won the Vela of the Year in Australia, so I was thrilled with that. And at the end of this period, I thought, okay, the hard work's done, now I can start promoting, let's have a rest. 13 days later, my house was partially destroyed by a bushfire and rendered unlivable for six months. While we were putting that back together, my husband just uh, discovered he needed major heart surgery. So then we had to put the house back together and him back together. All the writing went on the back burner. And when that was all over, and I was just thinking, okay, we're, we're fine now, let's get back to normal. My American publisher went bankrupt and all my books disappeared. At that point I was thinking, so, maybe this is a sign, I'll just give up now. And while I was thinking that, I happened to upon this book written by Serenity Press called Rice in the Dream, which were stories by other authors. And I realized that sometimes things go smoothly and sometimes things don't. And that inspired me. And for the first time in a couple of years, I actually had another story pop into my head. So I submitted it to Serenity and they said yes. And then Serenity picked up previous books that had been published in America. And that started my life with Serenity. And through Serenity, I met another publish an owner of a publishing house uh, called Gumnut Press and they have taken on two of my books. And I've just been in uh, contact with an English publisher and they are taking on three more books for next year. So life's about to get really crazy again. So I have a lot to thank Serenity for and a lot of inspiration for Serenity and I have to say thank you very much for that because I really kick-started everything again. But I wanted to say something else and this is a really full circle thing. Do you remember I said I had met this TV producer who was working in Australia? He was a great guy. He, he, he'd written episodes for Star Trek so he was like my idol. And he, he created this character for this TV series Farscape made in Australia. And the character name is John Crichton. Now here we are in Crumb Castle, um, organised by Serenity Press, and Crumb Castle, of course, is owned by the, the Earl of Erne, whose name is John Crichton. So how's that for? How's that for? Serendipity. <laughs> so that's, I know, I don't think he does, and I haven't had a chance to tell him yet. So anyway, I, because I'm from Australia and I have a lot of books, I couldn't bring them all with me. So I brought samples of all the books. If you're still here at the end, and if you particularly want one, you, I might give you my sample or sell you my sample. But I do have heaps of freebies. I've got loads of merchandising, little charms and things like that. So please come and see me, take some away. Uh, there's loads of stuff. And, and if you want to, look up the website, find out where the books are. 
It's quite exciting because I just found out they're now available in Target.com in America, so that's really cool. And also Walmart in America. You never be, thought I'd be so thrilled to see my name in Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am. So that's my story. I write romantic suspense. I also write romantic comedy. I do some urban fantasy paranormal too, but that's going to be released next year. So, and that's me. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Guys, Carolyn is the swag queen. If you don't know what swag is, it's lots of freebies. She's even got little wipes for your screens for your phone. Save me one of those. <laughs> she is amazing. So um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm going to introduce you to Bernadette O'Connor. Um, we're going to shift the gear here. Bernadette has a beautiful energy and you're going to learn from her. She's a beautiful Making Magic Happen press author, which is another publishing press that I own, and you're going to be inspired. Come on ahead, Bernadette. based in Ireland and it has called me to come here and, and bring her home to Ireland. So I do have some notes because I want to, I want to honour that calling properly. So my dad was an Irishman, very proud Irishman, but he left when he was 15 and made his way around the world into Australia, but he was a storyteller. And he could hold a group of people, whether it was his four children or a bar full of mates, for hours with his stories, <coughs> his tales of adventure from around the world. Now, I think I've inherited my dad's storytelling ability, but where dad's stories were more lighthearted, and they always, always ended in him descending into fits of laughter, or perhaps I should say ascending into fits of laughter, my storytelling is slightly different. Um, I'm quite deep. I go very deep. So my stories are often woven with, with soul lessons and healing and uh, the chance for wisdom to be imparted with people. I'm fortunate that I, I write fiction. They're the stories that have been gifted to me. But I really believe in the power of story as a creator of change. So my non-author role in life is I'm an energy practitioner. Some people at home call me a white witch. <laughs> However, so I work with people to help them heal. I, I help to connect with their energy body and bring them back to who they really are. And in 2016, having always written, but never actually written a book, a story landed with me. And that was my first book, Let's Go Home. And that story just one Saturday morning came and hit me. And I just would simply sit at my computer, listen to music and write. Um, and Let's Go Home is a modern girl's tale of pain and trauma, but her finding her way home to who she really is. It's a beautiful book. Let's Go Home, her, the character Harley, I is quite, you know, a New Yorker modern girl. She called me in 20, she was launched in 2018, beginning of 2018, halfway through 2018, she said, I want to go to Hollywood. I want to be adapted to film. So, you know, Karen and I, we chatted, as we do, and one door opened and then another, and Let's Go Home made her way into the Oscars gift bag in February of this year. And she's currently sitting in the hands of an international film producer. So Harley might very well have her day on screen one day, which I suppose is my vision. Again, not for the fame and the glory of any of that. But I believe, like I said, in the power of story as a creator of change. And if through film, I can help young women, older women, to grow and evolve and become more powerful and express who they really are in the world, then, then that's what I'm going to do. And I listen to my characters. So, Beneath the Veil was launched in February this year, the day before her big sister ended up in that Oscars gift bag. Beneath the Veil called me to bring her home. 
And so that's why I'm here. Karen enticed me with writing my third book in a castle. And I said, why not? Um, but really, I'm here beyond this retreat to take beneath the veil and see her in Ireland, because she's based in Ireland. It's the story of Clara, a seven-year-old girl, who has a voice. She's fiery, she's passionate, and that gets suppressed. She undergoes extreme trauma at the hands of her brother, her mother who doesn't stand up for her, her father who turns a blind eye. She gets married off and gets abused so that she can have a child. She gets cleansed by a priest because she's seen as carrying the devil when she miscarries that baby. And then she gets sent away to the Magdalene laundries. Now, I had a conversation with my cousin's wife, Pamela, on Friday. I arrived on Thursday and I went and spent time with Pamela. And Pamela said to me, now Bernadette, I love you dearly. I love you dearly. This is the Midlands for me. So you know these Irish Midlands. I love you dearly, but I can't get past that first chapter. She said, how did you write it? You know, did you just read up on people's stories? And I said, no. I, I said, they came to me, Clara, her aunt Maeve, Cynthia, they came to me and they asked me to write their story and I just wrote it. And I said, I didn't even know what the Magdalene laundry was. I knew that Clara was going to be deemed as evil and dirty and a bad girl and insane and sent away somewhere. I'd seen that. But I didn't know about the Magdalene Laundry. And it was the week I was about to write that scene, because I see everything as scenes. And something came across my Facebook feed, I suppose. And it was an article written by Sinead O'Connor prior to the Pope coming to Ireland last year about being sent away to the Magdalene Laundry. And I went, I won't insert the word, but you can imagine, that's where Clara ends up. And I said that to Pamela, I didn't even know. And she said, do you know my mother got sent away when she was 13? And I said, I didn't. And she said, take a cup of tea, come into the drawing room. And we went and sat by the fire and she told me the story of her mother. And I kind of want to share that with you because it really made me sit there and go, now I know why I'm here in Ireland. Because when you're half Irish, but you're an Australian, and you get gifted with a story about Irish women, you think, I'm not entitled to come and tell you, Irish women, how to heal the pain of your past. Who am I to do that? I'm just going to read a little excerpt because I really struggled with that for about the past few months. How am I going to go and do this and take this story? But Clara struggled with that same thing. Her aunt Maeve said to her, I should have my glasses on, hasn't it? So, her aunt Maeve said to her, it's not just about you anymore, Clara. You are doing this work for all those women who came before you and all those who will come after you. Those women who never had the chance to heal themselves and for all those women who will never have this chance. In rising in your power, you lead the way for other women to do the same. To which Clara says, why don't you just leave me well enough alone? How can a farm girl like me in the middle of nowhere on the west coast of Ireland change the world? I think all your queer team may be messing with their head now. So how can me, an Australian woman, come to Ireland and inspire change in Irish women? And I sat there and I listened to Pamela tell me about her mother, who got taken to Magdalene Laundry in Dublin when she was 13, the day after she turned 13. Her mother went with her. Her mother had been told she was they were going to go and buy her some clothes. <coughs> Remiss of me to mention that Pamela's mother went by, she was part of the inquiry into the Magdalene laundries, which resulted in the government, the Irish government, not the Catholic Church, issuing an apology to those women who'd been sent. This, uh, Pamela's mother was regarded as number five. She was person number five. She didn't have an identity in the, in the Magdalene Laundry, she was just number five. So number five was the eldest girl of 21 children. Listen to that, girls. 21 <coughs> children, you'll imagine it. Um, and on the day after her 13th birthday, she got taken. And her father presented her to 
the mother superior, and he said, she's your problem now, and he walked away, taking her mother screaming. <coughs> she was in the Magdalene laundry for 13 years, a tiny girl, there's photos of her, where she scrubbed sheets from hospitals and hotels in Ireland, and she saw horrific abuse at the hands of the nuns. When she was 16, she got, excuse the expression, she got pimped out by the nuns to a wealthy Dublin family. And for three years she worked there. And every Friday the nuns would come and collect the pay paycheck and take her back to the Magdalene Laundry. When she was 18, she got sent home to her father who had, who had secured a job in the local hotel as a cook. She rode 32 miles there and back every day for six weeks. And then the, then the owner of the <laughs> hotel put her up. She worked there every day for six years. And every Friday afternoon, her father would come and collect her paycheck and she never saw a cent. When she had four children, married with four children, and still working part-time, her father would come every Friday afternoon and collect part of her paycheck. And the tragedy is that on the day that I arrived in Ireland, number five received the last payment of compensation from the Irish government. And she rang Pamela as I sat beside her and she said, I got the last of that money. And she said, what do I need it for as an 82-year-old woman? I suppose it'll bury me. So, and I realised that we can't bury those stories because we have to heal them so that Irish women, so that the descendants of Irish women and women all over the world heal the pain of their past and rise into their power, to become powerful, empowered <coughs> women so that we see ourselves as equal to any man. And this is not about women's lives. This is about seeing ourselves as equal and in harmony. And that's the type of change I want to see in the world. So I came, I positioned this little talk as me launching beneath the veil in Ireland. But I'm not launching, I'm planting. I'm planting beneath the veil in Ireland. So when I'm home with my babies and my husband, I can trust that Clara and Maeve and those amazing women that make up beneath the veil will do the work and will inspire change. So that you young girls grow up knowing that you are powerful, knowing you are equal, and that you do it differently to your grandmothers and your great-grandmothers. Wow. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> it's, it's going. <laughs> I'm going to ask Kez if I can see George come down. Kez, are you there? I didn't see you. Oh, there you are. Sitting beside me. <laughs> Welcome, Kez. Good morning. I feel like a bit of a fraud because I'm not really in Australia. I'm from New Zealand um, and I moved to Australia many, many, many years ago. From my homeland and from the people that are my relations, Ki Ora Herewa. It means welcome and welcome to this place in Māori. Um, my ancestors were Irish, my, my mum, my dad, um, and all his brothers. So on a Friday night, um, we would gather around the dinner table. I also married into the Māori, Indian, Fijian um, tribes throughout New Zealand. And so Friday night with me was storytelling. To and when my ancestors passed away, that baton was handed down to me as a storyteller. I've got the most dreadful qualities, excuse me. Um, many years ago when I was offered the opportunity of coming to Australia, um, it gave me a space that I really needed. I was a busy mum, school teacher, headmistress, um, then became head of uh, Red Cross in New Zealand and was doing a lot of the admin there, so no time to write except little stories. So when I arrived in Australia for my time, all my family stayed in Australia except my husband in New Zealand, except my husband, who decided to work here as well. So I consider myself very fortunate to um, to have this opportunity to present my books, which are paranormal. I believe that I've been given a a special space to bring my ancestors into your lives and explain about the power of womanhood and about what they went through in 1800s and how we see it today. Um, 
sorry, I've lost my place. <laughs> so from around um, the oceans of the South Pacific, which is many, many islands where I've travelled to, um, and listen to the many stories and invite them to the many huts and temples and being told their stories. I've actually um, come here to Ireland to experience what it's like to live in a castle, to experience what it's like to be with many beautiful, brilliant authors, listen to their stories and think, I am different, I do have a right to write my stories. Uh, because sometimes when you're writing you feel, do I have the right? Who am I? And suddenly it's all made very, very clear that I have the right to tell you my story. I have a little stool at the back there with three of the paranormal books I have written. Uh, please come up and talk to me, tell me your story. I'd love to hear it. Thank you. Kez has lots of stories to share with so She also does children's books and has been to Japan. There's lots and lots that you can learn from Kez. So please come and visit her at the back and get to see her display. It's beautiful. Kez will also be published through Make a Magic Hat and Press this year as well, so watch out for that. Um, I am delighted to introduce an author who has two author names. <laughs> she has a non-fiction name and a fiction name, and she's going to come and tell you all about that. Come on ahead, Michelle Withering. Ah, yeah, waitering. I know the Dutchman. Waitering. Um, yeah, hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here in your beautiful country. Um, public talking, fun. Um, why am I here? Uh, right. Well, I usually write under Mickey Martin, which is an easy name to say. Psychological um, romance, which is a little bit dark and and fun, really. Um, and then I was writing all that when my, my family was experiencing something quite challenging, which was dealing with um, a child living with anxiety. And when I was writing the last book of my trilogy, I said to my husband, I actually need to write our journey and share with the world how difficult it is living with a child with anxiety when you're not really quite certain what you're dealing with. Like if you're, if you're not really educated with anxiety and you've never been through it before and your child's doing something that's tearing your heart and your world apart, um, it's, you know, you do your research and then you reach out for help and you realise that you're dealing with something that's, you know, quite severe. So I began writing 13 and Underwater over five years ago when my son was 13 and we were sinking <laughs> um, and reaching out to other parents and sort of listening to their stories and, you know, sharing our journey and it was kind of so... It was so shocking at, at how far spread anxiety is and depression and, and even back then, five, six years ago, it wasn't really that well spoken about. So I wanted to speak about it and I wanted to share our journey to help support other families with, you know, with, with anxiety, especially in the beginning when you're not sure what you're dealing with. So 13 was written under a year. I made sure I set up till midnight the year after I started <laughs> it to finish it on New Year's Eve only to realise that the story was still continuing and I had quite a lot more to write about. So it was written, then it was tweaked, and then my mother unfortunately passed away. God damn it, Mum. And um, the book had to be rewritten again because she was my son's biggest fan, so it, her passing actually triggered um, the journey of anxiety and my youngest son's journey with depression on another little level. So 13 was written and it was delivered to Karen and it was supported and and loved and embraced and it's reaching out to families now in Australia and I'm getting some beautiful feedback which is such a such a pleasure and I'm sort of working with um, Australia's Headspace which is equivalent to Ireland's Jigsaw I believe and I'm really excited to be here in Ireland connecting with Inspire so that really it gives me goosebumps and makes me a little bit teary because my mission in life with 13 is to just reach through the pages and hug other mums that are dealing with kids with anxiety. And, and for another child to even read 13 and say, you know, my mum's doing fairly well, or point to a page and say, mum, we need to sort this out. So that's that's why I'm here in Ireland. Well, because I've always wanted to come, of course. Mm -hmm. 
bond with the people. I've met some beautiful local people and I'm looking at one of them there, two of them, and I'm just having so much fun here. And the authors I've met at this retreat, I just feel like I'm a millionaire right now. So i um, probably got more to say, but I'm just so nervous. I can't wait to get off this party. But thank you all so, so much. And um, thank you. <laughs> So silent at breakfast. <laughs> that never happened. <coughs> um, please go and speak to Michelle at the table. She is also an amazing fictional author under Mickey Martin, and she has worked really hard to have her sec her no novel here, The Given, for you all to have a look at. She worked well past midnight many nights to get this book here for you. So go and have a look at that, okay? Okay, I am delighted to welcome uh, a new author who's come the whole way from the US. It was serendipitous how we caught up and I said, we've got to have, get you here and get this book launched. It's not here yet, it'll be here tomorrow, so sorry, you're going to miss that. But she's here as a, as a new aspiring author, Sonny C. Come on, come on up. stories that everyone else has been sharing about books that are published because I haven't yet published a book. Um, I have written a book and it's still very much a work in progress so uh, it was through Karen sort of pushing, uh, maybe not pushing, motivating uh, <laughs> to get me. <laughs> yeah, maybe she doesn't push, that's exaggeration. <laughs> motivating to uh, come out here and be part of the retreat and also showcase uh, a book that is still a work in progress and she was gracious enough to um, print a copy that as she said unfortunately isn't here yet so I don't have anything to show you uh, but what I thought I would share this morning is um, what actually inspired me uh, to write the book and the truth is I had been wanting to write since I was a child um, it's just that at the time that I did that, I didn't really know what the difference was between writing or being an author. Um, I used to read a lot. I mean, when I was even four or five, six years old, I would read several hundred books a year. Uh, it was my thing to do. I, I loved it. Uh, and to me, it meant making books. That's what I thought writing was about. Uh, and I had a school project where they actually told us to write our own story and draw it out and in fact uh, hole punch it and uh, sew in sort of a binding and I remember holding that book in my hand thinking this is what I want to do with my life. Um, I want to make books. Uh, and when I told my parents uh, who are Indian, um, you know most, I don't know how much you know about Indian culture but most Indians tend to say you should be an engineer, a doctor or a lawyer not a writer. Uh, so what I was told was, no, you can't, you can't do that. In fact, you're not going to be good at writing books. Uh, and I believe them. I thought, sure, okay, fine. I'm, I'm never going to do this. I will veer on a path um, that strangely I was good at. Uh, I've ended up going into science and business and putting those two things together and had a pretty successful career but always felt that there was something missing, uh, that there was something, a bit of an emptiness, and I didn't really know what that was. Uh, ironically though, I still <coughs> continued writing. I would just write training manuals or standard operating procedures or research papers. It wasn't really the creative writing that I wanted to do. Um, although secretly, without ever telling anybody, I would write stories uh, in the background and, and, and really not share them with anyone. And it was about two years ago that I realized um, this calling uh, for writing a book was still very much in me. And in fact, emerging and taking over uh, to the point that I, for periods of time, stopped working. I would just uh, work on, on this book uh, that I felt I needed to share. And I started one book, in fact, and realized this is the story that I want to share just yet. I started a second one, felt the same thing. Started a third one, yet again, felt the same thing. And then it's it, this fourth one that I've now completed um, that really sort of 
called me to, 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 to come together. And the, the thing that happened, I think, when I finished writing that book uh, was more um, a culmination of a dream that I've carried for such a long time, uh, where I listened to my soul and what was calling me rather than what people said I couldn't or shouldn't do with my life. Uh, so that story um, is, is, is essentially uh, a woman similar to me who has an Indian background but grew up in Colombia, South America, which is where I grew up, and immigrated to the US. Uh, and so the book is set in New York City, even though I don't live in New York. Uh, and she starts getting a series of visions that call her uh, to um, her soulmate. She doesn't know who her soulmate is, and she uh, opens herself up, I guess, more spiritually to receive more visions, and it is through uh, the series of visions that she gets that she learns how to heal some of her past relationships and heal herself so that she can figure out uh, and open herself up to her soulmate. Um, and so I've, I've, I've realized that uh, this book is still, uh, you know, a work in progress, and I'm sorry that I don't have something concrete uh, to show you, but I hope that at some point in life it gets out there. I actually don't know what's going to happen with the book. I don't really have a plan for it, other than for me, it is a dream come true, and it's a way for me to trust in my own soul and my own destination. So, anything, <laughs> uh, that's what I wish for you. You know, if, if, if you have a calling or some sort of inclination to do something that you want to do, um, I wish you, uh, I wish that you actually follow that path. So, thank you. It's very important to hear this, that, you know, from inspiring us who are starting out on a journey because every author is there at some point, whether you're successful or not. And the journey is very important. And the journey is very unique for every single author. I have published over 250 books in the past seven years for other authors. And every single one is different. In its own, it, take it in its own life. The ones I thought would be successful were successful. But then they get picked up on later on. And there, there's some that were really successful that I went, wow, that was amazing. I didn't see that coming. So you've got to be open to the journey. And when you embrace the journey, and um, being an author is so much more fun. So it is. So I'm going to introduce you to a lady who is from um, Ireland, Vera Toomey. Are you there, Vera? There you are. Um, Vera and I were chatting, and um, we met on by a friend um, who connected me from Melbourne with, with Vera, who has a very special book to share. Some of you may know her already because I believe that a lot of you have heard her story. I know that Lorraine did and things like that. I've read her story. So it's very important that this message gets out. And I see this as a beautiful platform for our Australian audiences and New Zealand and to, to hear this story and to bring this story into um, Australia. Come ahead, Vera. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, thanks for the lovely introduction, Karen. Oh, yeah. um, and um, I'm delighted to be invited here today. Um, it's uh, I was excited about being here, you know, to, to, to meet you all and to um, um, get an opportunity to, to especially talk to people from Australia about um, uh, the, the, this issue, I suppose, because. There's a lot of action going on in Australia at the moment for people that are fighting for access to medical cannabis. And that's what we have been um, fighting for here, for our daughter Ava and for other people over the last, well, publicly over the last five years. But uh, we've, been, we've been working hard to keep our little girl Ava with us for the last nine and a half years because she's, she's going to be going to be 10 in November and um, <coughs> sorry no the reason I kind of just tear up a little bit about that is because 
Our little girl was diagnosed at four months of age with a condition called Dravet syndrome. It is a chronic, intractable, drug-resistant form of epilepsy. And when we were inside with the consultant, the consultant uh, greeted us. Um, it was always a, a, a memorable experience, um, I'll put it that way, to meet with her. And on the occasion that we met with her, she told us that my four-month-old child would never walk, she would never talk, she would be in a wheelchair, and uh, that we should uh, look into the, the, the reality of residential care for Ava for the rest of her life, and that we should accept and prepare for that eventuality. And at that time, I said, I said no. And I, I believe that what has happened for us, that that woman that day lit a fire in me because I had been given a list of all the things that my daughter would not achieve. Nothing about the possibility of, with hard work and determination, what we could do for our child. Um, but of all the negativity and everything that she wasn't going to, uh, to um, where she wasn't going to get to. Now, she did have continuous seizures. She did have a very, very difficult time for a number of years and we graduated through each one of the pharmaceutical medications. And I'm not opposed to pharmaceutical medications by any manner of means if they're effective and if there are no side effects that are detrimental to the patient, that's fantastic. But that isn't what happened for our family. And Ava went through two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve different forms of anti-epileptic medication and all of them failed. Uh, some of them worked for a little time, but her seizures broke back through every single time. So um, I had an amusing conversation with two ladies earlier, um, one from uh, America and one from Australia. And uh, I was saying uh, the Americans were doing great and the Australians are fighting on over to get access to the medical campus. <coughs> because it was in, to, the, to America we were looking. Um, in America, progress had been made. I saw a beautiful little girl called Charlotte, Charlotte Figgy. Um, and she was just around the same age as my daughter, Ava, and she had Dravet syndrome and she was, abs she was absolutely thriving. She, she was riding a bike. And the reason that she was doing this was because of medical cannabis. And so I decided, um, very sensibly, I thought, that uh, Ava needs access to this as well. And I thought it was quite, quite reasonable. I thought, um, I, I, it, it's, it's, I, I can't get it to be the consultant we tried. I'll, I'll try something different. I'll, I'll try to get in contact with Simon Harris, the Minister for Health. I'll try and speak to him. In fact, actually, Leah Varadkar, who is the Taoiseach now, was the Prime, or the Prime Minister, says I was the Taoiseach of the country when uh, we started campaigning and trying to contact for Ava. Um, try to get on to him, no reply. Try to get on to Simon, no reply. Uh, emails. I spent days and nights and days and nights emailing, phoning, emailing, phoning, trying to get on to the air and trying to get on to the politicians. And every day, and Ava continued to seize. And we had to get the medication. And Ava's life um, involved seizures hospital admissions, come back out of hospital, seizures, hospital admissions, come back out of hospital. Um, we would have spent about four and a half months of every year inside the hospital with my daughter, um, because, solely because of her seizures. But now, today, as I'm speaking to you here now, as we enter October, my daughter is three years without a hospital admission in an emergency to the CUH because of the introduction of medical cannabis in her life. This is medical cannabis. <laughs> this little bottle contains medical cannabis. Now, I have a license for this medical cannabis. There are only 21 other patients in this country that have access to medical cannabis under a license. Simon Harris has introduced a programme 
um, under the Compassionate Access Programme, he calls it, but he forgot to do something. He forgot to attach a product to the Compassionate Access Programme so that people could apply for a licence for a product. So that needs to be fixed too. But we fix that as well. <laughs> and in the meantime, I decided anyway that uh, there was no possible way that I could write a book. There wasn't a hope that I could. My friend Brian had continued to say to me, Vera, you've got to write it down. You've got to write it down. You've just got, to. and I just, I just said, man, I can't do it. I could write a Facebook post, but you're serious. I can't write a book, I can't, you know? And we'd persist, he just kept on and on. And eventually I said, okay, I'm going to try. And we took, we took a lot of the, uh, my whole life for the last um, five years has been chronicled on Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm not a public person at all, but um, for Ava, which is the name of the book, we had to do it publicly. Unfortunately, in this country, my, um, my discovery has been that the only way to get anything done by politicians in this country is to shame them into it. So that's what we did. We shamed them into it. Um, it, it, it is effective, but it is not what anybody wants to be doing, to be out there talking about their public, in public, about their personal lives, about their daughter's condition. People should have access to this medication um, without having to go to the lengths that we went to. I have spoken regarding the medical cannabis um, above in Dalier and obviously all around the country, up here in Northern Ireland. I've spoken about it over in the European Parliament, over in the House of Commons, um, and still they don't have it done right here for us in either the Republic or in Northern Ireland, and, and that really has to be fixed very, very soon. Um, if I have time, have I time? Yes. Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I, I said I'd tr try and maybe read a small bit out of the book, you know, for you. But I didn't want to launch into it without <coughs> explaining to you that Abe was really well and Abe was going to school. Abe is, I don't really get like this, but this Australian connection's making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Abe has been at school every day that she was supposed to be in September, every day. And she's got a cold at the moment, right? But because of this, a cold is my biggest problem. And previously, my biggest problem was how much brain damage, 25 seizures in a day was after doing to my daughter. And the thing is, that that reality has been removed. And now she is an independent, oh my dears, feisty little devil. She's funny and she's determined and we're so proud of her, you know? But I thought what I might do um, is, I just might read a small bit of it just to show you what life was like. And while you're, you know, I, I hope I'm not going on too long now, while you're listening to this, just, just remember that she's, she's well, and she's going to school, and she's having fun, and I have three other children. I have Ava's nine, I have Sophia eight, Michael is seven, and Elvira May is four and a half. So they're engaging with each other, and they're having the best, the best time. Um, but this is the, the prologue to the, to the book. Um, we gave the we gave the chapters all a little tightly, you know, just to kind of set it off. I, this is my, my this is the only book I've ever written now, by the way, as well. <laughs> so I don't have any um, I don't have any beautiful bookmarks or anything like that. But we've got the book and we've got our story, so this is this is part of it. Um, I don't know. Me. It was early in twenty sixteen. So, oh no, it's a normal day. I have a sadness in me. I have anger in me, I have heartbreak in me. It was early in 2016, and just a normal day, or as normal as it ever gets when one of your children suffers from a serious chronic illness. Ava's epilepsy had long since taken over our lives. Every waking moment was consumed by it. I operated under constant fear and tension, waiting for the next seizure. It was coming, though you never knew when. 
but as sure as day it was coming. We had reached a stage when Ava was having several seizures almost every day with over 20 on a bad day. They may have varied in extent and severity, but each one was an agonising experience full of pain and terror. I was in the kitchen that day, doing the washing and chatting away with my mother, Catty. The door between the kitchen and the sitting room was open, so I'd occasionally snatch a glance at the children playing to see that they were okay. You know yourself when it's quiet, it's usually time to investigate what they're up to. The constant illness uh, had sapped the strength from my six-year-old daughter, Ava, and she'd been out of sorts for the last few days with another ear infection that raised her temperature, along with other alarm bells for an impending seizure, like how her previous night's sleep had been, which was disturbed. The family needed to be vigilant and being sleep deprived had become part of daily life as we monitored Ava through the night for seizure activity. Bang! A cry of distress came from the sitting room. I rushed in with my mother following right behind. Ava was lying on the sofa, her torso stiff as a poker and her arms and legs jerked uncontrollably. She had a fixed, far off look in her eyes. She wasn't in the room anymore, the seizure had her. I needed to control my worry and to be honest, keep myself from panicking. You go into automatic pilot mode when a seizure strikes. You tell yourself, keep calm. You know what needs to be done, just do it. While my mother stayed with Ava, I ran back into the kitchen, reaching up, and I got the rescue medication buckling from its appointed place high up in the press. It's powerful stuff, not to be used lightly. It may stop a seizure, though not always, but either way, it would leave Ava zonked for several hours afterwards. No, it wasn't to be used lightly at all. Still, it was all that was available. My mother taught me 20 seconds, Vera, as I hurried back into the sitting room. We still had time. It might stop of its own accord. You were to wait five minutes before administering the rescue medication, so it was agonising, waiting, kneeling beside Ava, praying for it to stop. After five minutes, she exclaimed, Vera, it's not stopping. She was right. If anything, the seizure was growing in intensity with more powerful muscle spasms, and it was time so to, to get... It was, it was time, so I gave Ava the medicine, hoping it would halt the attack. Afterwards, I looked up at my mother. What do you think? Is it easing off at all? She looked down at me with a pained expression. No, Vera, she's not coming out of it. I think it's nearly time to phone for the ambulance. You needed to wait to see if the rescue medication would work before the next step, the emergency ambulance call. But my mother was right. We were at that stage now. I made the call. Whoever answered the phone at the other end recognised the number. Hello, Vera, is that you? Is Ava having a seizure again? How long? Okay, we're on our way. The call-outs were so regular at this stage that there was no need to provide our address. They knew where we were. I had a short, a few short moments to phone my husband, who was at work with the, with the news and try to organise things for my mother, who'd mind the rest of the kids. I also rushed to put some essentials into a bag for the looming hospital stay. The ambulance arrived from a crewman in less than 15 minutes. Ava was still seizing, working quickly, we were, we were well used to the procedure by now. She was gently lifted into the ambulance and off we sped. About 20 minutes later, we arrived in Cork City into the Cork University Hospital. How thoroughly sick of that room I was. Some of the most upsetting, distressing moments of my life had taken place there. The doctors and the nurses surrounded Ava trying to stop the attack. How about if we try phenotone, suggested a junior doctor. Doctor, I said that takes half an hour to have an effect. I've been through this process so many times before. Yes, oh yes, that's right, Mrs. Toomey, it does. Have you experienced this before? Yes, I have, too many times, and that one isn't suitable. It never worked quickly enough for Ava. While this discussion was going on, the seizure stopped, just like that, as suddenly as it had begun. It had lasted 40 minutes from beginning to end. It had been a bad one, powerful. Another shocking day, but far from the worst. Ava looked wrecked and completely exhausted, lying in the hospital bed. As I gently held her hand and stroked her hair, trying to give her some comfort from the pain, or at least let her know she wasn't alone, I wondered to myself, how did my family end up in such a terrible predicament? Much more importantly, and more urgently, I strove to think of a way to alleviate her suffering and give her a chance at a better, healthier life. As I held her hand, I silently assured her, Ava, darling, I promise we're going to make it happen. That's the start.
she's coming to get me. Oh, no, no. There's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's one thing, there's a lot of young girls here, you know, today. And uh, that, 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 that other lady you talk about the, the Magdalene laundries there, you know. I, I, I just, it's about, you know, about the courage and about what the things that you have to do, you know. And when I, you know, I've read a good few books myself. I never expected that I'd write one, but I, I, um, I thought I wanted to write something at the start of it that kind of, you know, encapsulated the, 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 the this, this is what I came up with because I've learned more about life in the last nine and a half years than I learned in the previous 30. That's been my experience. My daughter has taught me more about myself and about people, all, not only in Ireland, but all over the world that have supported us. Um, we had to walk to Dublin. Um, I don't know if some of you are aware of this. I walked to Dublin from my home in Cork, which is 250-odd miles or something. I don't know. It took us nine days to do it because they drove us to that. They, they wouldn't help us and I wouldn't take no for an answer. So I said, if Simon Harris won't meet me, I'll walk up and meet him. And that's what we did. And on the way up, it started off as dozens of people and then it turned into hundreds of people. And by the time we got to Dublin, there was thousands there, even though the, the broadcasting services wouldn't say that. But there was over 3,000 people outside the gates of the Dáil when we arrived in Dublin that evening. So my, my thing was the, the, the fear, the fear about what will Johnny down the road think? What will Auntie Mary say if I'm going looking for medical cannabis? What will they say below at the shop? When they come out a mess, what are they going, they're going to be talking about me, oh my God. Well anyway, after a period of time, I got rid of that. So this is my, this is my thing. I maintain the greatest achievement in life is to lose fear. When you are no longer afraid, you are free. And once that happens, you will achieve any goal in time with focus and determination. So I'd like to say that to you girls, that no matter, no matter who it is, no matter what it is, you can do it. If you decide that you're going to do it, you can. And it doesn't matter how many people ever discuss with you that you can't do it. Push it away to the back of your mind, away to the side, and do what you want to do. Because they told me that I was crazy. They told me that it could never happen. But it's going to happen. And there's a compassionate access programme. And there's enough people now to bring it in to Ireland. And I'm so proud that my Ava is part of that. So just remember, have the courage of your convictions, you know? See why this story had to be told? Do you see the power in the written word to in instigate change? And Vera is so strong. And, and she's a quiet person. She didn't want to have to put herself on a platform in life at all. She was quite happy just being a mum at home with the children. Everybody's crying at the back. <laughs> um, but this story has to be told. And I'll be doing everything I can to have families like and various to to get this book and to realize the power that they have and by by standing up and speaking out i am a mother of six children right i am blessed beyond belief but not one of my children convulses in front of me i don't know what i would do if they did it once never mind 21 times a day um, and this book has to be shared so please tell your friends and anybody who needs to read this story Share it wide, okay? We need to support this movement, it's very important. Now, moving on, shifting the gear, and sorry, Laura Quinn, you have to come up after that. You can do it. <laughs> Laura is amazing, she's a local author, and she was one of my first ever students who has set up her own publishing press 
stay inspired and come and she's got a beautiful display down the back but Laura is the perfect person to shift the gear in this conversation and to show you her beautiful books thank you Laura I didn't prepare a talk for a reason, and I don't know whether Karen's trying to test me this week, but she keeps putting me up <laughs> after emotional talks, and I'm coming up with a big trend in Monkey Blue. I was meant to come up here with my hair styled and my makeup done and not be flushed, because it's already nail wrapping as it is, but that story's just <laughs> threw me off on yeah. the beaten track. Um, just goes to show the kind of things Karen can do. She deals with different energies all the time, and we go from sad stories to happy stories, and um, my writing journey began probably when I was five or six, my father would say, but um, I'm a local girl, Newtown Butler, and lived in Australia, lived in Belfast, and I followed my father's path of bookkeeping, the mundane kind of work, it paid the bills, it put oil in the house, my parents were happy, I was happy, people around me were happy, so when people around you are happy, you should be happy, but... There was a wee itch inside me, this creative flair that I wanted to push out, and I always told I had my English teacher, Mrs. McAleer, who I should have invited to this event because she would have loved, kind of, she always said from I was young that I had that in me, that I was going to be the storyteller, I was going to be the one that would put words out. Um, so, on the birth of Cian Quinn, who just changed my path completely, he's three years of age, but in 2017 I had Cian. And we decided to stay at home and bring our family up close to, fa um, close to our old family and settle down and get some roots because we were just we didn't know where we were going. Um, Cian is a bit mischievous and he's like a little monkey. And his auntie from the other side gave him a little yellow raincoat and a teddy. And from that, Monkey Blue was born. It was very simple. I know people look and say, where does your inspiration come from? But Monkey Blue was just literally born within um, five to ten minutes. Um, Mac McAvoy has come up to speak after me and he is the same. The ideas is right can come very quickly but there is a process of meeting the right people that are going to bring these books to publication. Now, I had a lot of um, different avenues but there was something about Karen that just, I was, once I got in her ear that was it. I was just going to, Monkey Blue was going to be published whether, um, who I was going to meet, it just happened to be that I was aligned with Karen. I was never going to deter from what she was telling me. So basically, from Monkey Blue and Friends, um, I was going to be dropping Cian off at nurseries and as an anxious mother, I wanted him to be open to his friendship groups because sometimes we're not. We kind of get together in cliques and we don't mean to do it and we socially, we would have, there's five girls in my house so we'd have known the McNally girls and we always hung about together. So when you get older, you start to break away from your sisters and realise there's room for other people in your life. And Monkey Blue is kind of like that. It's friends come in shapes and sizes, and that is his slogan. So anytime he goes anywhere, we have a big clumsy giraffe. We have E Lady Eagle, who's the little wise one, and we have Millie the Caterpillar, who kind of reminds me of Vera now, because she's very inspirational. She's the little female of the group, but she actually is the stronger. She's small and tiny, and I've done that purposely, but she's actually the stronger version. So um, the stronger character, sorry. So this is how your characters come to life, just daily things. Um, Meeting people, it was all about Cain, and then obviously Monkey Blue and Friends, everybody loved it, we wanted to see how it would go. So from that we had Snowflakes and Christmas Cakes, which was a Christmas one. And then we had, um, what is the third book, Karen? Yes. <laughs> Snowflakes and Christmas. Oh, My Family Tree, so um, I was bringing home a baby, a new baby into Cain's. We were just used to being Cain, and we were bringing home Danny. And um, Monkey Blue, my family tree, my brand new baby sister and me, we kind of switched it up. And um, that was the third book in the collection. And then the fourth one is The Trailblazing Crew. So I basically met with Kevin McHugh. I was in getting my hairstyle, which I do every week now, and um, with a lovely girl called Donna Brady. And she said, You need to get in touch with Kevin McHugh. He's a fabulous artist and he's going to bring this all to life for you. Now, this was 2017. And all I had was a white piece of paper. And from all of that, we have all of this. And there's a lot of it going on. And we sold the rights of the Monkey Blue brand to a company called Bootful. These are kind of things you don't think are gonna happen, by the way, when you start out as a writer, you think this will never happen. You'll never get this big call. You'll never get this big break. But it can happen. Bootful own a 3D studio. So they love the, the books that much that they put me on a podium with Beatrix Potter. And they published the Monkey Blue brand through a 3D app. 
so now I'm up in blue. I wanted to set it up for today, but he kind of, um, with the technology around here, I thought I'd leave it for another day, but he actually comes alive in your living room now. So that's how quickly things can happen. So Monkey Blue actually dances beside us. So these were things I dreamt of. <laughs> I probably just thought it was crazy at the time, but I dreamt these things up and now they're actually happening. After meeting Kevin, there's a lot of inspiration coming from Kevin. He loves Halloween and he keeps his Halloween decorations up all year round. So on the way home from Kevin's house, I read the Walton Eric collection and it's the most popular. It's the one that's winning the awards and it's kind of bringing attention to Monkey Blue because the Walton Eric collection is the second and it's, it's just got legs of its own. And from What on Earth is Under My Bed, again, What on Earth is in My Garden Shed. That was inspired by my father. Because um, he likes to hide in the garden shed. <laughs> Whenever his family comes round, he lets all his dishes <laughs> So each one of those books, they are my favourite. I do. You're not meant to have a favourite child as such, or should you have a favourite book, but they're both different. Monkey Blue is the educational brand. What on Earth is the more fun-loving brand, and it's spooky, and there's a lot going on with it, but... Um, there's always a wee hidden meaning of what's actually under the, under the bed and in the garden shed. It's never what children think, it's always a reasonable explanation. So, what now is my garden shed? I was trying to get copies for that for today, and even though I rushed and everything, they will be here tomorrow, which is very typical. But um, from garden shed, um, I went and started Carnland, we started going to loads of school visits, and I told them I wanted to finish the collection for the book full day, because they wanted four books of each. So that was my first kind of, okay, there's deadlines now, there's pressure now, and um, what on earth is behind my teacher's head came from a school visit. And I kind of joked with the wee girl that gave me the inspiration saying this is going to be a book, and then what on earth came my teacher's head and done and completed the covers ready as well. And that's both of the collections kind of aligned, and they're doing really well, and they're thriving, but it was all due to Karen, so I want to give her a massive thanks, because the academy is, I didn't get to college, I didn't get to do the... Serenity Sisters, but Carolyn has blessed us all with these little Serenity um, magical little bookmarkers. I turned mine into a necklace, but that's the creative person in me. But I feel as if I'm now kind of joined with all these women. I didn't get into a sorority, but this is kind of my wee unit of women, and they're so inspirational. And I can't mention them all because I love them all. I made some fabulous connections this week. Is my time up yet? <laughs> but, so thank you all. <laughs> Now, Laura does school visits, guys, so if you want her to come to your school, she's local and she'll come and inspire. She's amazing. I think she has 16 books in production. Laura, 16 books in production? 16 books in production in two and a half years. That's hard work. <laughs> now it's time to, to welcome the man of it all. <laughs> Mac McAvoy, you can handle it. Come on. <laughs> Yes, men write books too. <laughs> Imagine. Um, yes, uh, lovely to see you all this morning. How are you, Emma? Hi, Mike. Um, I just want to welcome you all here today. It's nice to have a little gathering like this in such lovely uh, surroundings as this this morning in the corner of Fermanagh. Um, I'm just going to get my notes out because. I'm getting old, so I do forget things. Um, okay, first and foremost, um, it's been lovely today already to have met so many inspirational people. Some of the people who came up here and spoke, it was, it was quite moving, and uh, it's been lovely to meet people from all over the world. I myself finally made it here after a very long and arduous journey. I live about a mile and a half <laughs> that direction. <laughs> So uh, if I appear a little jet-lagged, you'll probably forgive me for that. My name is Alan McAvoy, but from the age of about 12, I've been known as Mac to pretty much everybody, apart from my mum and dad. Um, so many of you people are so far ahead of me on your respective journeys as authors. Um, it's been ever so slightly intimidating, but it has been more so incredibly inspiring already this morning. So. Um, that aside, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got here. I uh, I'm just have one book written, second one out in about two weeks' time. So my journey as an author 
it has been quite short so far, so I'm going to give you a little brief, brief synopsis of how I kind of got to be here today. I was, I was born in Port Leash, which is pretty much in the middle of the island of Ireland. Um, grew up in a very loving home and uh, enjoyed school, did pretty well at school, and that's where I found my love for uh, reading. But uh, during my school days, I became obsessed with music, playing it, listening to it, reading about it, writing about it, and um, I discovered drums, which became uh, the love of my life for many years. Sorry, Donna. <laughs> And uh, after school, I went to college in Carlow, where I got a diploma in architecture. And it was whilst working in an architect's office in Port Leash, about a year later, that a friend of mine was passing one day and dropped in to say hi. And he told me about a band in County Galway who were looking for a drummer. And uh, so I called up and I went and I did the audition and I got the gig. And for the next 16 years, that was what I did for a living. So um, during that time, I fulfilled so many ambitions that I had as a teenager. Um, we had hit singles and we toured the world, and played some legendary venues, played festivals to thousands of people and did TV shows and the whole rigmarole of that. So um, it was also my first kind of foray into writing, I suppose. I had dabbled with writing in school, just writing silly kind of eight line poems to amuse my mates and stuff but uh, in the band I kind of inadvertently became one of the lyricists for much of the original material we put forth so um, moving jumping on a bit about two years before I finished with the band I kind of got a calling of sorts to work with kids children particularly kids with special needs so uh, while I was still on the road and touring I um, started working voluntarily in what was then Ellenbrook, and what is now Willowbridge and Enniskillen. So I used to go in there on Mondays and Tuesdays and then I would go and play for the rest of the week. And I just found it so incredibly rewarding um, to work with kids like that. So we worked with kids really from, with disabilities ranging from very mild to profound. So it was quite a learning curve and quite an eye opener for me. So eventually in 2008, I parted with life on the road after 16 years, um, got married and um, after spending six months in Australia on an extended honeymoon, parenthesis party, um, I tried to settle into a normal kind of a working life, five day a week life, which took a while but I got there and uh, I work now uh, in Devonish Enniskillen in the learning support department. Um, from coming up, since coming home, I've established my own drum academy at the house as well, and I still play drums at the weekends. Um, 2012, October, uh, my son Jacob was born under extremely difficult circumstances, and so began the parenting roller coaster. Um, Jacob had severe silent reflux, and he was dairy intolerant, so his first six months here were pretty turbulent and painful for him. But it was while nursing Jacob one night, um, or early one morning, depending on your mindset, <laughs> that I really started to think about the myriad of issues that uh, children have to deal with, young children. Um, all too often we get caught up in the pressures, I suppose, of adulthood, you know, paying a mortgage and paying your bills and, you know, uh, providing for your kids, you know, worries about getting sick and so on and so forth. But that night I kind of thought that kids have so much to deal with and a lot of it, even though you can help them along the way, they kind of have to figure their own way around a lot of this stuff I find. So that gave me my idea for what would eventually become this here, my very first book called Webster's Best Day Ever. So more about that in a minute. Um, my daughter Myla arrived a couple of years later. She was also dairy intolerant. I remember thinking, oh Jesus, here we go again. But uh, luckily because of our experiences with Jacob, we got her on the correct meds really quickly and, and got her sorted. But I remember when Myla was about a year old, I sat down one night and decided I would actually try to write a book as opposed to just scribbling things down. Um, Jacob, my, my son, who's seven very soon, he suffers really badly with anxiety. 
um, sometimes all-consuming. Um, it's not easy for him. And we have brought him to any number of therapists, uh, healers, consultants, doctors, the whole shebang. And although they have helped to some extent, I don't think anything has made a real lasting difference. Um, so it affects him every day on some level. And at times it has got to the point where he didn't want to leave the house. So I made my mind up that the books I write are going to be books that contain a message for kids and for parents. They're not just, uh, these aren't just stories about some cute farm animal buddies. They uh, carry this message to help parents and their kids try to overcome some of these problems that children deal with from day to day. Um, reading is a big thing in my house with my kids, which is great. Um, but I began to notice that at night when I was reading to my kids, so many stories were, you know, fairy tales or superheroes or uh, princesses and so on, which are all lovely, happily ever after stories, but nothing really that you could apply to real life, I found. So that's kind of where I got the idea. So in the Green Hills Gang series, there are six books. Um, each one stars one of the six characters in the books, and they all uh, touch upon a different topic. Um, this one is about anxiety. The next one's about friendship, there's one about body image, there's one about bullying, another one about nightmares, and so on and so forth. So, um, what really hit me was when I went to the various schools when the book came out to read to the kids, usually between kind of five and eight years old. Um, they got it upon, upon one reading of it, which was a real moment for me because it just, I knew then that it kind of it hit its mark. So that was, a, that was an important moment too. So, um, my second book, I got the cover of yesterday. It's just down the back there. So the cover reveal was yesterday. Hopefully it will be up in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, that's a lovely kind of a warm and fuzzy Christmas themed book um, dealing with friendship and how it's nice to do things for your friends without wanting anything in return. And uh, I'm very excited about that one. There's four more books in this series which are written and ready to go pretty much. Um, I'm also currently about a third of the way through writing a kind of a, a warts and all um, account of what life is like on the road in a van with a rock and roll van. <laughs> so uh, that one probably won't be in the children's book. <laughs> so um, I have a number of other ideas for books as well in the pipeline too, as well as ideas for some cuddly toys of the Green Hills gang characters and also Lots going to be happening in the next few months going forward. I want to say a special thanks to Karen um, for believing in my books and giving me the start. Um, I think what you're doing with your publishing companies and with your academy is really beautiful and well done to you. I think we all need that. Um, also, just want to give a mention to Kevin McHugh. He's not here today, but um, Karen being local, me being local, I suppose. I know I'm a blow in, but. I'm local as well, and Kevin McHugh being local, it just proves to you young people here today that um, if you believe in it, it, it really can happen. I mean, there's, there's books that you're seeing today coming from this area, basically, that are worldwide um, available and getting recognition all over the world. So what I would say to you guys down here is if you believe in something and you really feel that you have a passion for something, do it, because I can't imagine anything worse than spending your life doing something that makes you unhappy or that you feel miserable doing. Find your place in the world and find your purpose and uh, just grab it with both hands and go for it. So um, I hope all you good people here enjoy the rest of your time in Ireland. You've got some nice weather here for a change. I'm just glad the PA didn't blow up when a male voice came through the speakers. <laughs> but um, So that's it. Uh, but I am calling. Thank you. He did good, huh? <laughs> I thought he had written a book there to read to us. <laughs> we have got two more speakers, guys, and they're going to be about five minutes each, okay? And then we're going to have some tea, coffee, some snacks down the back, okay? So we will film. Are you guys going? Are you going? No worries at all. It's lovely to have you. Bye.
sing a little song? I can sing. Can you sing? And my next to welcome Amanda Schubert. Sorry, Amanda, your audience is half left. <laughs> I guess we're just going to have to eat all the sweets and the cakes now, guys. There's more for everyone. Okay, back to the short people. Alright. Now, hi, it's lovely to see everyone. I am still partly up here wondering how I got here in amongst all these wonderful people. Pretty much the story of my career is I'm the one at the party who's milling around, everyone's like, oh, they're fancy, they're fancy. And love, how did you get here? It's like, the door was open and I stumbled in. <laughs> and that's how I made, made myself here too. I think um, Karen said that two years ago when Serenity Press came here to Ireland, I was dying to come because Ireland's been a dream. It's where I've always wanted to come. It's been, been a, a bucket list, list goal. So when the opportunity came around again to be here this year, I said, yes, sign me up. And I think I was the very first name on the list. Yes, I'm going to Ireland. I was doing the embarrassing happy dance with my kids. And then I stopped and went, ah, oh, I suppose I should actually start writing something now, hey. So I set about going, well, I've had this story sitting with me for quite a number of years. Um, set in Ireland, and for someone who's never been here, it was, I thought, what am I doing? Um, so I started trying to write. Now, I'm more than known as an illustrator. Art is, is my first passion, it's, it's what I do. Um, I've got a piece here that I'll hand around. This is, I brought my daughter with me um, to, to just help me at the up here. All that. So I'll give that to Karen to pass around. So creating fantasy drawings was probably more what I did. So when it came to wanting to write a fantasy story, which I desperately wanted to do, it had been like ever since I was young, reading fantasy stories to more appears, Tolkien, um, Harry Potter, all of those were just, they're, they're still my classics, they're still top row on the bookshelf. So I wanted to write that. Now when it came down to sit and write the words, I had the image clear as day in my head. I knew exactly how it looked, I could see it, I couldn't describe it. I was trying to write the words, no, that hasn't captured, that hasn't captured, that, no, no, no. I thought, okay, I might have to call Karen and say, no, I can't come, I'm not a writer, I'm, I'm, I do not. So I thought, well, if drawing's what I do, drawing is what I will do. So instead of trying to map out my story in words and plan, my, I'm not a planner, I'm a fly by the city of pants kind of person. So when it came to, <laughs> hence I'm doing this today, I, <laughs> I tried to plan it out step by step and it just was not how I did it. So I decided instead, going almost comic book style, I will draw my characters one by one. I'll, I'll fill up my time drawing them exactly how I see them. And within a week or so, I had my sketchbook full of characters. I had the visual. And suddenly I found myself going, I know how to write this now. Like, you know how there's language translators, you know, Japanese, Chinese, translating to English and so on. I feel like what I do is translating pictures into words. So the only way I could get to write my story was to draw it first. And so I, I bought my sketchbooks and everything with me today and wandering around the grounds and everything has just been, I think I've taken a photo of every mossy leaf, every little thing, because every detail I can get that I can then translate is what's going to build my story. Um, so I reached a point in my story based on Ireland and, and set in the modern world, travelling to the other world and, and tying that all together and how magic can exist in this world even though, you, you know, perhaps it, we're not even living in the most magical of times, getting that, that cross link between the two. Um, I hit a real a, a standstill, probably two months ago. I, I came to a complete stop in my story. I'm 40,000 words in and I'm aiming for 90. And it just stopped. And no matter what I did, no matter what I drew, I couldn't get past that. So being here this week has been the people I've met and the things that I've been able to wander around and see has been the most inspiring thing. I, I could, it's what I needed. It's what I needed to do. And being able to be up here and speaking to everyone else, I suppose, what I'm bringing to today's discussion is that however works for you, whatever you need to do to inspire that creativity is what you need to do. So for me, I draw and I love to write, but drawing needs to happen first for me. That's that's what I do, that's my language. So um, if anyone's out there and they're sort of wondering perhaps, how do I get inspired? I'm going to do it like this person. I'm going to shop point. I'm going to do a JK Rowling. I'm going to write it all on a napkin in a cafe. If that's not for you, 
and that's okay. And that's been my biggest takeaway from this week is it's okay to do things my way. Um, so I am here today. I've got a collection of my artwork out on my table. I've got a folder full of the drawings and things that I do. Um, I still love illustrating, and I have had the pleasure of illustrating for a couple of um, children's books authors in Australia um, in a style that's not quite my comfort zone, but I'm also a big believer in if an opportunity comes, say yes, and figure it out later. Um, so, I don't know where Karen's got to, but I'm sort of reaching the end of my time. And before I get, she's got to stop me dancing. Come, Karen, stop, stop it. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I thank you all for listening to me, and I said I hope you'll come and have a look at some of my, my work out the back there today, too. <laughs> So talented. I love her greens. You just call me and it's just beautiful. And we are down to our final speaker. We are down to our final speaker. Adria has just got off a flight from the US this morning, packed into my dad's car and rallied here to just land with these ladies this morning. Perfect timing, perfect timing. And I'm delighted to introduce Adria L. Peters. everyone. Thank you so much. I'll keep it short. You've been sitting here for a really long time. Uh, I come from a state called Vermont in the United States and um, where cannabis is uh, legalized and uh, used so uh, in medicine and many things. I am, uh, I, it's interesting because I first want to congratulate everybody that's written a book, who's thought about writing a book, who's here, in experiencing this and being part of it because it's just, it's sacred. The, the act of writing something is a very sacred experience. And for me, I tend to process whatever I'm thinking through writing. That's the only way I actually know how to process something. I can't necessarily say straight up how I feel about something. So my series, Becoming True at Sky, that's uh, the first book um, called The City on the Sea is coming out at the end of the year. And it's a compilation of all the things that I'm obsessed about. If I were to ever give advice to somebody that is wanting to be a writer or um, doesn't know where to start, I would say make a list of everything that you're obsessed about and then write about that. Because you're going to spend many years with the, that novel not you know, writing it, editing it, promoting it, sharing it, and potentially writing something similar. I think that we write, the stories we tell are who we are. So even if you're changing, you're writing one book in Ireland or one in Australia, it's still you, fundamentally you. Um, I write fiction uh, that's very grounded. I, um, the things that I was obsessed about were Mathematics, <laughs> death, what the heck is a soul? Why, why do I feel separate from this thing called a soul? And physics. I was obsessed with theoretical physics. I'm not a scientist. I don't have any scientific background. I, uh, I didn't know why I was so obsessed with it until I started writing and I discovered that it blew away this the great conspiracy called time. <laughs> and even from a young age, I thought, I would ask my dad, who's a scientist, why is time? What? I don't get it. <laughs> like, who said it's 1230? Like, I, I don't get that. It didn't make sense to me. And subsequently in my life, I experienced a lot of death as a young person, a lot of tragic deaths, uh, deaths of people I loved quite dearly. And I could not accept that that was the end, that they didn't go on, that life didn't actually start again, immediately or maybe in this little place that I call the city on the sea, which is where the character in my novel, when she dies suddenly, goes to and discovers that she's actually quite busy there as a theoretical physicist. So um, I, you know, I like to take something giant and complicated and really hard to understand and try to pin it down and put it into a story that makes sense and that you could use. I hope that with True at Sky, you'll read it for the science or you'll read it because you lost someone that you love dearly and you don't know what happened to them and you need comforted. 
in knowing that it doesn't end and that in fact in the city on the sea which is sort of my version of heaven that the world completely revolves around you <laughs> and 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 that's the truth whether you're alive or dead the world revolves around you it is your world it is your soul you are not separate there is no there and here it's all one and I think that everybody in this room, I'm, I'm pleased to be in this audience because I think that's something that holds true for everyone here. And that there isn't anything to be afraid of. And uh, as we go forward and we write these novels and we share these novels and we experience the rest of the day, because I'm the wrap up, <laughs> um, I hope that you feel comforted knowing that uh, we're all in this together and uh, you're not separate from anything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adria. I'm gonna stop there. Let's go get some tea. I hope that you have been inspired, that you learned lots from everyone, and that you share these amazing authors in your communities because everybody has a story to share and they've shared theirs and everybody needs to know. Okay, take care guys. Chat to you down the back. <laughs> <laughs>